<laughs> so I read a story about a Christian named Garrett. And Garrett went um, with his daughters. It was a cold winter day, like something like this. And they went to the YMCA to drop off some, a gift for charity. And then his girls had, you know, the rest of them. And while he was in the YMCA, there were a lot of people there working out. You know, they were doing the treadmills, they're doing bikes, they're in their exercise clothing, they're sweating, and there he is sitting there in a nice kind of comfy chair waiting for his girls to come out of the bathroom, and he's in his park and in his pants, and, and a joke came to mind as he thought about the dynamic of how he's sitting there in this workout center watching everyone work out, and he could go and tell people later today, I went to the gym today. And everyone thinks that he did the great thing of doing exercise and stuff like that. But all he was doing is sitting in a comfy chair in his parka as he waited for his kids. And as I think he was a, a Christian leader, a you know, pastor or something along those lines, and as he started to think about how that was funny, he thought, you know what, it really is funny when it comes to church. You know, where, why do I come? Do I come basically just to show up? so that I can tell people I'm at the church, or that I come to see God start changing and transforming my heart. The key issue that we all, any of who claim to follow Jesus Christ as the front, who we're dealing with hypocrisy, right? In fact, uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, had great admiration for Jesus Christ, but was not a Christian, and someone asked them, given your admiration, why? Do you not become a Christian? And this is what he said. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. What a, what a damning indictment of the Christian who profess to say, hey, we want to worship and serve and live according to Jesus. And yet when we're out in the world Monday through Saturday or even Sunday afternoon, <laughs> We are living for ourselves rather than others. Today we're going through a series uh, that we've titled Grace Swap, where we extend grace to one another. Uh, that's what the church is about. It's how we are called to live life. And we are today are looking at the uh, first letter A, which I have titled Authentic. See if you can remember what the G and the R were from the past couple of weeks. What was the G? Generous. Generous. Good. And the R? Responsible. Right. And today we're looking at authentic. That is, Christians, there needs to be a genuine desire not to just show up and observe as spectators, but really that we view the worship service in many ways, the church, as an opportunity to work out our salvation, as Paul says, the fear of God. We're going to be looking at a key passage where he talks about authenticity or sincerity, and it's found in 1 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, please open them to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5 is the key verse that we're going to be focusing on, where I think Paul talks about or addresses what it means to swap grace with one another in an authentic way, in a sincere way, in the way in which God, through Christ, wants us to swap grace. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And in this passage, here's how I would define authenticity, in particular biblical authenticity in light of what Paul's words are. Authenticity is love-producing, holy driven God-trusting transparency. Authenticity is love-producing, holy driven God trusting transparency. Transparency, obviously, is where you can kind of see through that, that what's coming out of you is coming out of you because there is this love that you trust in Christ. It's holy. It aligns with the scriptural truth. And it's transparent. People see you for who you are, and that is Christ at work in your heart and your life. That's what I think authenticity, biblical authenticity, is. First thing we're going to look at is how it is a love producing. It's the result of authenticity, of biblical authenticity, is love producing. But before we do that, we need to set the context. 
of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. It's probably the fall of 62 AD. It's a little over 30 years, almost 30 years since Christ has died. Paul is likely in his mid 50s based on my calculations. And he's writing to his kind of amanuensis, or he's not amanuensis, his disciple, as it were, is the one who he's been mentoring for a number of years, Timothy. And based on some of my calculations, Timothy's in his late 20s, around 25 to 27. And Paul has left him in charge the church of Ephesus while Paul has gone on a trip, as we'll see in verse 3. Uh, it's about five and a half years before Paul will die. It's after his first Roman imprisonment. And uh, this is his 11th book that was ended up being inspired and being placed into the scriptures to recognize that it is the scriptures. So that's kind of the setting. We're going to pick it up here in verse 3 to kind of set the context of verse 5. Here's verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain people not to teach in any different doctrine. Now, maybe you have a good understanding of uh, geography in the ancient world, or all of right, but just for the case or for the reminder, for the rest of us, Macedonia is in Greece area. He might have been somewhere in Thessalonica. Timothy is here in Ephesus, and he probably took a trip this way, but he's sending the letter back to Timothy, who is still stationed in Ephesus in his late 20s. He's basically been appointed to be kind of the functional pastor of that church, the leader of that church. And one of the things that Paul is doing is he apparently got some news that, that Timothy's a little bit nervous or uncertain about some things. So he's giving some instructions to Timothy about what to do in these circumstances in the church in Ephesus. And uh, looking back at verse 3, in particular, here we have this young man, 20s in his 20s, Paul says, I want you to charge certain people not to teach different doctrines. The uh, Greek word here is heterodoxy, other truth, or other really falsehood, but it's presented in truth, truth that is not in connection with what God has revealed in Scripture. And what Paul says to Timothy, as, as the leader in that church, apparently there were people that were coming in and they were trying to teach things that were not true according to the scriptures. And Timothy was to go up to those individuals and say, don't teach this here. Pretty tough stuff for some younger man <coughs> who's just starting off in ministry by himself. And in particular, it's not just different doctrines, it's not just Falsehoods is kind of along the lines of like maybe there were not that there were in that day, but like Mormons or something like that. Hey, here, here's another gospel, here's another book that Jesus kind of inspired. No, that's not the case. It's not just that, but in verse four, we also see it's not just heterodoxy, but it's also the people who devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation. So there's some stuff that's not true, and then there's stuff we just don't know if it's true or not, but we don't need to be spending a lot of time on it. Now, as a theologian, as someone who studies the Bible, I have my fair share wonder as to how this is going to be put together. But notice what Paul says. These people are devoting themselves to those things. This is the main emphasis. Their focus is not on the main things that God wants them to have their focus upon. Speculation isn't bad, but if it takes the front spot, then it is bad. In fact, they're more concerned about just speculation than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Remember from last week when we focused on responsible, stewardship is another name or another word for, for responsibility. We're not doing what God is calling us to do. Our focus has been diverted. And so we're all just focusing on whatever we can think of. That's the context that Paul's talking about here. Now we come to verse 5. Take a look at verse 5. No, the aim of our charge is love. That issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. 
You see, when you're focused on either things that aren't true, that are heretical, that are the wrong things, or you spend most of your time on the things that are conjectural or speculation, you are not caring about a person's life being transformed in terms of how they interact with other people. All you care about is vision. And what Paul says is dangerous for Christians that makes us like the Pharisees where we end up only focusing on what we know and not on the transformation of our lives. What Paul said, the point of his charge, the point of the, the reason why he's saying shut these guys down, or even more, the reason why he wants to focus on the scriptural truth that God has given is that he wants people's lives changed. He wants love produced. What is love? I'm a working definition of love, and that is freely giving the good that God desires. Freely giving the good to others that God desires. That's what Paul wants our focus to be. That's what he wants our life to be demonstrated, and that will only happen when we are engaged in the Word of God and the level in which God wants us to be involved in this. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart. Two aspects of that love here. First of all, the good that Paul wants Timothy to give to these false teachers is to correct them, to rebuke them, to say, hey, you're going wrong. Love isn't always easy. Sometimes it involves tough conversations, direct words, but the concern is for the person's long-term benefits. Because it's what God desires us to do, which is to confront individuals. And the folk is that as they are confronted, they will realize the error of their ways and repent. And instead of devoting themselves to either heterodox teaching or heresy, they instead are focusing on the truth, and their lives are starting to be changed as God wants them to be changed. That is the kind of authenticity that God cares that we have. And that is, we become more loving. But it's not just more loving. It's also issues from a pure heart. It's fully driven. <coughs> pure heart. The word here is clean. Now, this is where we get a difference between biblical authenticity and the world's authenticity, right? I'll give you a good example of the world of the end once. Um, it was a nice day in our church, the last church in the last place in Oregon. It was uh, during the summer, so I decided to kind of go out to a park and just kind of read and pray and whatnot. And the people at the park bench next to me were talking. We kind of exchanged our names and introductions, and they knew it was a pastor. And I was here to just kind of think and pray and interact or whatever with the Lord. And uh, so after they realized that they kind of started to focus on their own dynamics, and I probably don't focus on the Lord, but that was kind of difficult because as they were focusing on their dynamics, these two people were ex-spouses, husband and wife, that had been married but had gotten divorced. And as I'm sitting there, they are bickering. I mean, they're using every square word possible, and I think it was every three words was a square word. They would kind of hit one another, not in an abusive way, but just whatever. Finally, they start to leave, and they knew I was a pastor, and said, oh, don't worry, we are just that way. And I'm like, yeah, it's obvious why your ex-spouse is here, you know Because they were just living out who they were. They were being true to themselves, and so doing was being very crass and very disrespectful to one another. It wasn't kind of a play kind of fun. It was just kind of a, it's like, really? Is that really truly necessary kind of an idea? That's how our world views on this. Be true to yourself. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He says he wants that purity or that authenticity to come from a pure or clean, the Greek word here is clean heart. That there is this 
this heart in our lives that it's internal that, that we want to honor God and that there's no obstructions in our life between what we want to honor and how we live it out. The idea of this clean is really, really important and I really appreciated this dynamic uh, because of this bug. I don't know when Laura can't answer this. Anyone know what kind of bug this is? Huh? Looks a little bit like a mosquito, doesn't it? It's, it's kind of like a magpie. They, they call them midgets in uh, kind of fall. And they're look, they look like mosquitoes, but they don't bite. So that's the good news. Um, but it's about the size of a mosquito. The problem with midgets is how they fly. They don't fly alone like, um, like mosquitoes do. Instead, when it gets warm and you're driving along the lake or wherever there's water, you see them all gather in these like tornado effects. You see the, these things? These are all thousands or maybe millions of midgets, right? <coughs> when you start driving through them, you start to get this. <laughs> I mean, you get this, this green goo that starts to, that you can't, you can't, it just, it just smears. In fact, you have to have to wash your car when you get home because their blood has a level of acidic that will kind of corrode the paint of your of your cars and your vehicles, and it was just coated. You can't see very clearly through your windshield. Paul says, "I want you to have a clean or pure heart. I don't want midges on your windshield." Essentially, what he's saying. I don't want you to be obstructed by the sins and brokenness of your life. There, there's this commitment and passion towards living for God because when you allow the midges to develop in your life, accidents happen. That's what's going on here. Holy driven reasons, your motivations for interacting with people is not to be a jerk because that's who you are. <laughs> but to be a person who loves people like Christ because we love people like Christ. It's our motivation. But it's not just wholly driven reasons or motives. Clear heart, pure heart. It's also a good conscience. Good conscience. A, a clear is the, the Greek word here. So it's kind of like that windshield. You can see perfectly through it. It goes both in terms of the past and the future. Having a conscience is where we have a recognition of what is right and wrong, in particular in a biblical context, that we accept the biblical truths of what is right and wrong. And so when we apply our lives, apply to our lives, we reflect, did I do the right thing looking in the past? A clear conscience says when we look back and we find sin, we say, God, there's a confession, right? What does 1 John 1, 9 says when we confess our sins? What does he do? He cleans the windshield. When we find that midge or that many thousands midge, God, forgive me for that. God cleanses our conscience through confession. We take stock of our lives. Authenticity means, you know what, God? Here is my life. Evaluate what I have done. I will confess anything wrong that I've done. You should. David is one of the examples of how this wrong. But it's not just a clean conscience in terms of the past, it's also a clean conscience towards the future. And there it's like, I don't want to put myself in a position to where I will sin. I will avoid those circumstances. And so this is where the midge becomes a wonderful illustration of good transparency or authenticity, right? When we drove once, we did not realize that midges primarily come out at dawn or dusk. And so when we once drove, it was just... I mean, it was solid green on the windshield. I was like, almost wanted to, I did it, kind of open my window, I started to put my, then I started getting bitches in my face. That's not a good idea either. 
But I want to get to, and there was no spot to get off for another mile. Finally made it, so I was praying a lot. We have friends, in, we have some friends from Iowa that just live down near Iowa City right now. They can tell you, man, that was just big. Every time you see them, the first time, remember those midges or that, those bugs? They couldn't remember them. The midges and the, the green goo that happened to develop. But, you know, which, yeah, that was crazy. Clean that off. Once I learned that, that they come out at dawn or dusk, I would make my trips during those times. I would adjust it so that I wouldn't drive through that mess. You get a few, but it wouldn't work these whole clouds where we just haste your fall. We do that in our lives. Paul says. We have a clean, clear conscience where we confess our wrongs and we avoid putting ourselves into positions where we are likely to be tempted or commit new wrongs. With biblical authenticity as well. Oops. I'm going to jump ahead here. We'll go back to verse 5. Last thing. Not just a good conscience, but also a sincere faith. A God-trusting faith. Anyone who looks and takes a close look at how Christ loves people realizes that it's only something Christ can produce in us. It's not something that comes naturally. Where we trust God, we need you to work in our lives to produce this reality in our lives. In fact, the word sincere there is literally in Greek unhypocritical. Unhypocritical. We're not professing this, but we actually live it out. We have the motives, we evaluate ourselves, and our destination is love producing, where people encounter Jesus in us. Where other people around us aren't like Mahatma Gandhi, who say, I like your Christ, but I don't like we say, God, produce it in our lives. Help us to obey you. As a result, Timothy is charged to tell people, to censor people, to say, shut up. That's not what God is focusing on. He wants to see our lives transformed so that people see that we care about them genuinely and we will do whatever it takes, even confronting them, if we see what they're doing takes a sincere faith. Which now gets to the Romans passage. I don't know about you, but there are some Sundays, even I as a pastor, I just do what I mean. Ah, uh, I gotta get up. Gotta be in church. Gotta preach. Gotta interact with people. There's just a way to difficult. I don't know about you, but living the I don't always feel like living the life God's called me to do. How do we go about dealing with those situations in light of having a biblical authentic faith? Paul gets that very clearly in Romans chapter 7, where in two times he says, For I do not understand my own actions. This is the Apostle Paul here. I don't get why I do what I do. For I do not do what I want to, but I do the very thing I hate. Down in verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. There are times in the Christian faith where our feelings or our motivations aren't where it should be, and we recognize that. That's why we need to have a sincere trust in God, a sincere faith that says, God, I need you to change. You see, part of what we need to do is to speak the truth to God. God, this is where I'm going. One of the coolest things about being Christian is God doesn't, isn't bothered by the fact that at times we don't care to want to follow and obey Him. What He cares about is that we come to Him with it and that we trust His word over what we feel or what we're experiencing. 
That's why Paul says, even though I feel this way, even though I don't understand why I do what I do, why I sometimes sin, even though I know I should not, I am committed to cling to the truth of Romans 8, 1, that in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation. That Christ has cleansed all my sins. He has wiped all the visions off my life. He's lived the perfect life, and that is who I trust. One of the key ways in which we demonstrate trust. I came across a really good example of this a number of years ago when I was listening to the radio. And let me get their names here. A couple was talking, David and Kristen Finch. They were talking on the radio about their marriage. Over the course of their marriage, they learned that David had Osbergers. If you're familiar with Osbergers, people that have Osbergers syndrome do not have the ability to have emotion or empathy or sympathy like most people do. There's some kind of dynamic physiologically that actually prevents them from doing it. Well, they didn't know he had Osbergers. And so she would come home and she would share with him her life. And she would ask and expect him to show kind of sympathy or empathy for it. And he was, whoo, he didn't even know what, I mean, he didn't understand it. And they started trying to work through it. Some Eventually, they figured out that he might have Osbergers. And so one of the things he decided to do is to talk to her. When you are dealing with this, what are you wanting from me? How do you want me to respond? Because I care about our marriage, but obviously I cannot give you something that you need because I don't have the ability to do so. But yet I care about you. So she instructed him on what to say and the best possible way to say it. Right? I've got a picture of this couple. And he did it. He showed me here by simply following the directions that she gave him. Here's an audio clip from that show that talks about the results and the impact that it had on the church. Listen to us. Ready for it? David is still making his way through things today. He listens to Chris's promise at the end of the day and he waits until it's time for him to say that sounds hard and he says that sounds hard and it's gotten your time. At some point in this process, it felt like it did become a second nature. I can't I can't claim that it's true empathy. Um, it's more intellect than it is, you know, just raw feeling. Empathy and emotional response. Exactly. It's knowing versus feeling. And you're not really empathizing, and she knows you're just saying it by the road because you're trying to do it. Is that actually satisfying to her? Maybe it's not exactly heartfelt. <laughs> that, um, I don't know, I guess if it works well enough for me, you know, as the wife, I really I wanted him to have empathy, I wanted him to put my feelings first, you know, just in general. Um, there are times when I when I wish he truly understood, I think, but I I did understand that that's just not how his brain was wired. You know, okay, I'm gonna tell him this is how I need you to react, and and it worked. And like the fact that he's going through trouble in a way of showing you feelings. Absolutely. And in those moments of you know when you go through the emotions for the person that you love and say what they want you to say because they specifically said that's what they need. We have all had the experience in our marriages that does the job. That works just fine. <coughs> the reason why I like that account because I really think that they're touching on the difference between biblical love and the love of this world. He does genuinely care for his wife. He can't always show it in the way that she would like. But he shows it in the way he can. That is love. That is a willingness to say, hey, given the limitations that I'm bringing to the table, 
I want you to know I care deeply about you. I might not be able to care the way you would like or need, but that does not mean I don't care for you. He's trusting, and she's trusting, that while he can't naturally respond, he authentically wants to. Anyways. So, Paul is trying to form Christ in us. He's trying to see his, us as Christians to be authentic in a relationship with one another, but especially the Lord. What's our take on point this morning? It's this. Be fully authentic. Be fully authentic. Authenticity means, God, this is where I am at. I need you to change my life. I trust you, and as a result, I want to pursue obeying, obeying you, and that means sometimes confessing, sometimes it means avoiding certain circumstances, because ultimately, I want to be the one who produces love in my life towards you and towards everyone else in our life. Be wholly authentic. Wholly authentic. Let me give you four different ways, and the four tires, where we can demonstrate this grace ball of authenticity. First, look at uh, worshiping. <coughs> Do we allow people to have emotions in the service? You know, there have been times where I could not, the events going on in my life, I could not speak out anything in terms of song. I mean, I was just weeping. A lot of times in a lot of churches, the pressure and expectation is that there is hardship and difficulty, then, you know, please leave, right? This is only a happy place where we enjoy the fact that, you, yes, we do enjoy the fact that Jesus is here. But you know what? Sometimes even the Son of God wept tears. Part of authenticity is saying, God, this is where I'm at. If you are having one of those moments of strong emotions that you feel you need to leave, that's fine. But being who you are, what you're going through with us, we will be praising God. And sometimes I've had to worship not through my movements, but through the voice of my brothers and sisters. Authenticity means we allow people to express the issues that's going on in their life, knowing that they and trusting that they are wanting to move closer towards Christ and whatever in that moment they are dealing with, Christ needs to meet. Another way in which I think authenticity needs to be allowed and celebrated and respected in the church. When it comes to communion, I don't say it every time we do communion, but most of you know the scriptures that if there's not something right in your heart, you're better off to pass the plate without taking it until you can make it right. Sometimes you can make it right in your chair before you get it. Great. But there have been times in my life where I totally screwed up as a husband and I did not have any time, chance, and opportunity to set things right with Laura. And that happened once in seminary, and so I let it pass. But it occurred to me that can still happen now for me as a pastor, for friends and the elders as they're for distributing it. You know, I know how it is. I've been in a church, but you didn't make me. I wonder what's going on there. We want to pry when really we should be praying. Whether it's an elder or a pastor or someone in your row, if they feel led from the Lord because they can't deal with something in their life at this point, and you see they don't partake. Lord, I don't know what's going on. Be working with the brother. 
See, that's authenticity in the church. It's not where we're judging. You know, we trust that hopefully they would know us well enough that if they need someone to come rely upon, they can come and talk. But where we recognize, hey, this is where they are. God help them in that area. It's authenticity in terms of worship. What about in terms of growing? This kind of gets back to the emotions. One of the things that I have realized and appreciated about the scriptures is that there's a whole book full of wide range of emotions where people express what they're going through to their God. It's called the book of Psalms. Right? One of the things that I have learned in my life is in those moments where I feel blah or indifferent towards the Lord, and I know that's not the case, I know it's not uh, supposed to be, it is still the fact that I am broken. I am waiting for his full redemption. But one of the things I appreciate is either open up a psalm or just tell the Lord, God, this is where I am. Change me. Change my heart. And have the feelings, but do not stay. Paul talks about this here. Ephesians 4 26. Be angry. It doesn't say suppress it or get rid of it. He just says, don't sin in it. Have the emotions. Tell the emotions to God. But don't let the emotions lead you towards the path that God is not today. Another wonderful scripture that I think helps guide me in such times. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, so many times... The reason why I am not right in my life is my focus is on the wrong kinds of things. On the things that are wrong. But Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything that is excellent, if anything is worthy of praise, think on these things. Sometimes what I need to do is to change my focus. I say, God, this is not right. Oh, that's right. This is the true thing. There is, therefore, no condemnation for those who have Christ Jesus. What about in terms of investing and interacting with other people? I think it's important that we are honest and open with one another, that we share at times we are struggling. There also requires discernment, right? It probably is not the best time to say right before like 10 15, right before someone gives me an announcement. Oh, by the way, I had the worst week ever. Right. And sometimes maybe that does need to happen. And if you're the person that's receiving it, and that person is, you know what? I would rather have you guys stay in and talk in the lobby than be in here. That is what God is calling us to do. There's a genuineness, a realness of one another saying, you know what? We are here for one another. We are wanting to allow people to express where they're at so that we can come along together and say, you know what? Who's in charge? Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 2 and 5. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For each will have to bear his own load. If someone is carrying something in life that is beyond their ability to carry, then help them. But we can also sometimes err on the other side where we want to manipulate it, make it all about me. Focus on what I care about, what you know what I mean. Oh yeah, this, yeah, this hangout is just really just bugging me. No, it's the worst hangout on earth. Who cares? It's an hangout. Get you some flippers if you need, you know? I mean, that's, you know, recognize the difference. The last one, witnessing. Witnessing. How do we be authentic in our witnessing? So many times I came across the picture. So many times I think when we're talking to other people about the Lord, we feel like we need to be this person. Right? Super Christian! And solve all your problems. 
answer all the concerns and issues that you have. No, yeah, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. And my life has been perfect since then. Hmm. I put my faith and trust in Christ. And I can tell you what, he's walked with the life, he's walked with the valley of the shadow. I can't imagine what life would have been like without him as we went through in Brazil in some of the difficult situations in ministry that we could have. We tell people what it means to put your trust and faith in a Savior like the Savior that we have. Do that. Then, shout out to the works. I'm going to close with this illustration from this man. His name is El Fadi. Listen to this. I had to use this as my read it just this past week. I was born and raised in Saudi Arabia as part of a devout Muslim family. I believe that Islam was the only true religion, and that those who did not accept Allah as their God and Muhammad as the messenger were all to I had nothing but contempt for Christianity, and at age 15, I was prepared to die on behalf of all of so many young people who were journeying to Afghanistan and fight the Soviet Union alongside. Osama bin Laden, who was a hero to us at the time. But after finishing college, he didn't do that in Saudi Arabia. I finished college in Saudi Arabia. I went to the United States to pursue a graduate education in engineering, but I had a dilemma. Islam teaches that its followers are not to offend Christians. And in the Muslim world, people truly believe that the United States is a Christian nation. In other words, that everyone who is born in America is born a Christian. So he moves to the United States despite that. And after living in a dormitory in 1989, I began feeling the need to become more familiar with the American culture and the English language. I heard of the International Friendship Program, which paired students like me to local volunteers who would provide help and hospitality. And I signed up for the program not knowing that it was a Christian ministry. <laughs> and I didn't see where that started to work. A young couple. The program contacted me and indicated that they were a family assigned worker. For the next seven months, this family showed me love that far exceeded my expectations. A love of the sort I had never experienced among my fellow Muslims. In November, this family invited me to the home, their home for Thanksgiving dinner. Only then did I realize it was a Christian family. I had never realized that Christians are actually filled with love. And not hate as my Muslim upbringing. This family had never shared the gospel with me, but they showed me what the gospel looked like. A few years later, after earning my master's degree, I joined a local engineering firm. There I met a born again Christian, and I was impressed by his, his joy, his peace, and the light that seemed to shine forth from him. When he invited me to his home for Christian dinner, I noticed his wife and kids had the same qualities. At this point, I could not hold back my curiosity any longer. I asked him why he was so different from those around him. He told me he was a born again Christian and he shared his testimony. In May of 2001, going against everything my Muslim faith taught me, I made my first visit to a Christian church. And over the course of the next six months, I learned who Christ truly is. So that in November of 2001, I accepted Christ in my life. I came to know my beloved Jesus through simple acts of love. That I would add wrong. And I pray God will use my own simple act of love to bring glory to him by drawing others into the state of He is now a professor at Christian University, teaches theology and many. All because people knew so much about the Bible, right? Not completely. All because people love authentically as they have been. Be fully authentic. And you will see your life change. You will see others' lives change. Heavenly Father, 